an annoying cat in the room and an annoying puppy in the, in the hallway. <sighs> and one named Wade out the Deadpool and the other one out the Scarlet Witch. And I'm wondering why I have a chaotic couple of fucking animals. Ah. I'm calling me old man Wade. Damn you, old man. Fuck your old. Damn it, Wade. All right, let me know when you are ready. All good. All right. So, welcome to the Old Man Wade Show. I am your host, the God of Stubble, the Lord of Laughter, Old Man Wade. And I'm recording with someone, a comedian that I love, <sighs> podcaster, host of, excuse me, a couple, well, actually three podcasts. You've heard him on the show before. Uh, he is a dragon slayer. You may not know this. Uh, he's a reason why there's only four dragons left in the House of Dragons series. <laughs> if you wonder why there are no chartreuse colored lightsabers in Star Wars, it's because he took the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard him on the show before. Slate Ham. I feel way overhyped. I shall try to live up to it. It's good to be here, man. It's good to see you. Yeah, same here. Let me tell you, I'm going to overhype you every time you come on here because this is not something you have to do. And I am <laughs> super appreciative of it every fucking time. It's always a good conversation, man. I got to absolutely flex my nerd muscles. There's only a few friends I have that I uh, I really enjoy the conversations with. You're one of them. So. And let me tell you, do you know how happy I am that I may or may not have given you my um, Marvel mm -hmm. Unlimited thing? Because I was like, I one of my favorite things in the world is... Putting, get like having the ability to give other people the access to comic book stuff. I I cannot thank you enough. Uh, when you sent it to me, I was departing for a tour in uh, Eastern Europe, so I spent a good chunk of my time in Poland, right on the Ukraine border. And I was reading. Uh, it will come up later in this episode, but the uh, God of Thunder line uh, of Thor's. And it had Gore the God Butcher and uh, the entire uh, saga of Lady Thor, and the it just it was it was really really welcome. And I revisited a bunch of old Todd McFarlane era Spider Man stuff, and it just man, it was it was very 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 needed, and uh, I'm eternally grateful for it. And I still go in and tickle those uh, those nostalgic little uh, muscles every now and again. Yo, can I tell you we had um spoken about that briefly. And so I was like, let me go back and just kind of like look at the Todd McFarlane art of Spider-Man. And I forgot that no one draws a flexible Spider-Man like he did. Well, so if you listen to Todd talk about uh, that era, right? And I forget who was uh, editor at the time, who he was answering to. It might have been Michelini, DeFalco. There were a handful of those Marvel editors. And at the time when Todd came over, he had been doing Hulk and they moved him over to Spider-Man and he had pinballed back and forth, I believe, with DC at the time. He had done Infinity Inc. for one of the companies. He had done Batman Year Two, I think. He had done some stuff, but when he got to, when they gave him Spider Man, uh, he just went off the rails. He goes, "I'm gonna draw." He goes, "When he's in the costume, one, he goes, we're gonna bring back the red and blue costume. So that's where you see the black costume turned to Venom, and he goes back into that costume that he finds under the bed, but." Todd talks about how when he's in the costume, he thinks of him as a bug and human anatomy be damned. He yep. was going to do what he wanted to do. And he was also breaking the panel rules that Marvel had at the time, put everything in a box. It reads sequential left to right, up to down. And Todd would go in with this graphic design background and he would, the webs would form the framing and he would, the characters would punch out of the screen and they'd cross into other panels. And he was such an adept storyteller that it didn't ruin anything. He wasn't making it jumbly. He was making it clear. And so by the time they gave him his own book, he's the reason that to this day, Spider-Man's webs are those, I think the word is spaghetti, uh, spaghetti webs is what he calls them. The, <laughs> they, those are the standard by which you draw comic book webs and comic books. And at the time he was breaking all these crazy rules. Uh, so if you go back and look at that, look at the way those are some of the first instances in those early amazing Spider-Man that he did 
of just the page being a big piece of art instead of the page being six or eight panels of art. And this is what I appreciate about people who not just enjoy something, but kind of engulf themselves in it. Because I was going to bring up the webs and I loved how they looked like actual spider webs, not just random ropes. Yep. And like this, like how like the webs were kind of like wrapped around each other. And, and like you said, he looked like a bug. Like he's a, Spider-Man is supposed to terrify people when you <laughs> when, he, when he sees them. And granted, it's all the jokes, but when you first see him, it's kind of like, oh shit, it's a spider. Like you know what I mean? It's you know, and it, he's supposed to strike fear. He's not Batman or Daredevil, but he's there's still supposed to be an element of fear when you see a spider like hanging over you. Spiders rarely engender happy feelings in people, and I just think to <laughs> nobody's like, hey, yay, put that spider in my mouth. Nobody, those things don't happen, but. To, to, to see him drawn that way, I guess, is what lit me up. It just always was so fun flipping through those pages. And every panel, if you look at it, is pinup quality. When you look at the, oh, the yeah. stances he puts them in and the fact that in any given book, you'll find three or four different, like, really dynamic poses of Spider-Man in midair with his feet up over his head or twisted all this way. And even if you tried, I would challenge anybody just with stick figures to try to imagine 10 different poses for someone in midair, much less the hundreds that Todd probably pulled off over that run, you know, and I don't know how many other artists after that, but it's a, it's really impressive to see what they did uh, back in those days artistically. Uh, I'd, I'd deep dive on this forever, but it's been nice to revisit it. And that Marvel Unlimited app is just incredible. There's an artist you might really enjoy, Mike Diodota. Uh, Mike, oh. He um he did a, he does a really good Spider-Man, but one of the things, I have one of his art books. I was in Newberry Comics and it was a $60 book, but it was on sale for 30. And I was like, gotta get it. Mm -hmm. And he has this, he starts getting into how he draws certain characters. So there's a leaping image of nightcrawler but then when you look at the next panel under what he's explaining it's him taking a picture of himself on his back in that uh... picture and so he took that image of it and created nightcrawler and i love what i love seeing that because it's like oh so this is how you do it you know unlike people like greg land who literally just steal other people's art or <laughs> or um, what was it the uh the porn star face that he has every woman <laughs> <laughs> Shock, oh my god face which is probably going to be the um the cover art for, for this um, episode is uh <laughs> two storms o face <laughs> <laughs> so you know what okay so uh switching times before we get back to the nerd stuff the last time we had a conversation we were talking about coffee yes black coffee and like my grandma's love for it your love for it and how i was jealous of coffee drinkers Last week, me and my wife went to breakfast, and I don't know what it was. I said, I kind of wanted a coffee. So I got an iced coffee, and I drank it. I was like, oh, my God, this is so good. And my wife reminds me that, like, every X amount of years, your taste buds change. Ah. So I'm drinking this coffee. I was like, wow, this is really fucking good. So the next, so that following weekend, I'm working. My boss is like, hey, I'm going to Dunkin's. Do you want a refresher? I said, nah, give me a coffee. And she, like, was like, who the fuck are you? I'm like, please just give me a coffee, please. So I'm enjoy I'm now enjoying coffee. And it's the weirdest Good. thing in the world because it's I didn't realize how refreshing it is and how satisfying it is just to sit and drink a cup of coffee at work. And it was just it was completely euphoric. I'm sitting at work, everyone's talking, I'm just sipping away at my coffee, laughing and joking. I was like, huh, I could get I could fuck with this. It's it's complex is what I what I enjoy about it. You you go to a soda, you go, you know, you're getting carbonation, you're getting that bubbly pop and whatever flavors attached to it. And most of those flavors are pretty flat. They're not they're not complex. Coca-Cola, I guess, could be, but when you drink a Coke, you're getting what you always get when you drink Coke. And when you drink coffee, you're getting so many different things even the same beans can be done so many different ways you know it's the right cup of coffee is just uh, it's a magical thing it magical really and I'm, I'm enjoying the shit out of it so i'm tomorrow i'm gonna try black coffee i'm gonna give it a shot i'm gonna mm -hmm. all black coffee and see how i feel about it Ta taper down get rid of the 
get rid of the milk first and then get rid of the sugar. Uh, I still drink sugar in my black coffee. So it doesn't, uh, I don't put a lot, I don't turn it into a milkshake, uh, <laughs> but it's black coffee with a little bit of sugar. And that's just the way it's, I, you know, when, when you drink it, and I'm, again, I'm so very big on the Ethiopian coffees, but the, the little, like that raw sugar, that they put in the bottom. Of, I, I just can taste it in the bottom of those little cups with the grounds that didn't quite get, ah, uh, because they don't use filters. It's so, anyway. So what I, it's funny thing you said that. So I'm about to put regular coffee in my, in my uh, regular sugar in my coffee. My wife goes, stop, and pulls out the raw coffee. Yeah. The raw, the raw sugar. And she yeah. goes, drink, use the raw sugar. You'll like it a bit more. Yeah, she, that's, there's something sharp about regular refined sugar in coffee that it like really messes with the flavor for me in a way that a, that granulated raw stuff doesn't. It, and again, it's, it might just be, you might just have a more refined palate than I do. Well, I've been drinking coffee. I like it's a, it's a, you just figure out over the grand, however many years or decades or whatever you're doing shit. What your thing is, you know what I mean? I've had, there's some people, I mean, at some point, I'm pretty sure my brand was gas station coffee with, you know, (laughs) an inch of refined sugar in the bottom. And it was basically just a highly caffeinated Coca-Cola at that. I mean, it just, you know, that's terrible coffee. So it's your taste buds change, I guess. You just, you like what you like. (laughs) And I got a buddy, a buddy of mine, when I, I got a coffee from him, he goes, I was like, this is, I'll explain to him how good it goes. He goes, yeah, now you all need is a little dip. I'm like, yeah, nah, I'm cool. Nah, bro. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not, I was like, I am, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> there are lines. We we yeah. must have lines. So here's a, so before we get into the goofiness, one, one serious question. This is something that came up with me in therapy. Mm-hmm. My therapist always has these random questions for me that like really leave me thinking. And I spent the last, I spent eight of the 12 months this year out on surgery. So I had a lot of time to just like self-reflection. And one of the questions he asked me was who I was. And it's one of the weirdest questions in the world to ask because it's a simple question of like who you are. Some people would just say like, you know, um, I'm a nurse, I'm a comedian, I'm a security officer, I'm a police officer, whatever, whatever. And so that's been the theme of the, of the last like month and a half. And so he asked me last Monday, he goes, like, you know, who are you? And before I ask you, this was something that came to me and it was just like, I'm a work in progress. Mm-hmm. And it was the, and, it, and he, and it was funny. Cause I think he said, this might be the last time he asked that because it was probably the first time I answered honestly, like quote unquote, and without a, without a hesitation or things like that. And so it was just like, and he goes, well, so we get into this and like, what is a work in progress? And so who is who is Slade Who are you? So that that question is a, it's a dangerous one. Um, mm. I've I've probably written privately extensively about this, but the once you once you assign a label to something, and I am this is that is whatever the combination of of object and and verb is, you know. Yeah. Once you once you start slapping that label on stuff, it things start to take those forms. Yes. It's a I remember with my ex that I was with for an enormous amount of time and all of the dramatic problems we had and the violence and the craziness and this and that. As I look back at it, the amount of times I went, You're absolutely crazy for doing these things probably reinforced that behavior. It wasn't until you know, we we separated and things started to turn for her because there wasn't the constant being crazy and being called crazy. So for me, I have really spent the last couple of years dropping all of the, the labels I had already chosen to wear. Um, yeah. And what I've found, and not just dropping them, but just kind of setting them aside for the moment. Like, you know what, I don't have to be this because this comes with all of this attached expectation. So I kind of started a list of things I am not. And for me, as you speak of being a work in progress, it's I think of myself as constantly in flux. 
I am certainly not the person I was five years ago. I'm not the person I was five years before that. I'm definitely not the kid I was when I was 20. And I'm not the kid I was when I was nine. You know, all of these, these watershed years that I kind of remember that changed me a little bit. And if I held on to any of those things that I was at any of those given moments, I'd probably still be climbing up a lot of hills that aren't meant for me anymore. You know what I mean? And that's the stuff that sticks with us. You go, you know, your, your father or someone raises you going, you know, you're the man of the house and you're never supposed to let your family down. And, and that, that, that wears, that wear you wear that around like yeah. armor. That's, that's this thing that you are. I am a protector. I am this and that. And then somewhere in your life, those family members really screw you over and they do terrible things and they, they kind of go off and live their own lives and they forget about you. And you are sitting over here abandoned alone, yet your father's dumb words are jammed into your head. You must protect your sister. You must protect your mother. And you're crying in the corner going, you know what? They haven't called me in five years. They don't, they took my daughter away all these terrible things people do to their families. And you still have this, I've got to protect them. So that's, those those labels, those things that we kind of just cling to us like barnacles through our whole lives. I'm a fan of the scrub brush, man. Uh, you don't have to wear any of that shit. And I'm just now looking at the things I, I don't want to be anymore. Right? I've lived enough life to know I, I want certain friendships. And, and to have those friendships, I can't have the kind of friendships I've had in the past. Some of those things don't serve me anymore. And I can either cling to them. Ah, got to take all this shit with me. Or I can go, you know what? I'm not going to have these kinds of relationships anymore. That's something I'm not anymore. Instead of saying I am only this and this kind of relationship, I just go, well, I'm not going to have those kinds of relationships anymore. Everything else is still fair game until I eliminate it. But I found that a much better place to live than trying to wear two or three labels all through my day and stick to them so fervently. It's hard. It's very hard. Can, you know, it's funny you say that, and it, it reminds me of a conversation I had on the previous podcast with my homegirl, Shannon, about social norms mm -hmm. and how they really, be, a lot of these things have become outdated. Uh, let's We can use you, for example. I remember when me and my wife first started dating, I had this, there was this bartender, greatest bartender in the world. And not because he could make a, a really good drink. It's because he knew people. He could turn a 10, uh, a giant club with 10 people into the best party in the world, even though the club's technically empty. And now she said, it seems lonely, but I was like, not really. He's got a lot of friends and he works until two. He leaves at three and he goes and fucks all the blondes until his heart's content. He gets up and he exercises. He does it all over again. And he's he's incredibly happy. And I've had conversations with him. He goes, I'm happy with what I'm doing. And he's still doing it. And for him, it's not a lonely life. But again, these were our so these were our norms that we were supposed to like, you know, 2.5 kids, picket fence, blah, 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 blah. And you start talking about the things that you're told. My mother used to call me crazy all the time. I have a, I am a, I'm a former cutter. I'm a former, uh, I used to have suicide on my, on my mind on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is because I couldn't get the thought of my parents calling me crazy out of my head. And once I moved away from that, because as cliche as the, as cliche as the phrase is, words do mean something. You know what I mean? And there's listening to the show. This guy was like, "That's the reason they're called um, the reason they call called spelling a word because it's a spell." If you want to get really hippie hippie about it, and like once I moved away from that, and like me and my wife just have this this thing where we just like you know, there's certain things we just don't do, and then she's getting me to do new things, and these new things are introducing me to more people. Uh, the first time I asked you to come on the show, I was nervous as hell. Uh, I'm a bit of a fanboy, and we've had this conversation <laughs> before. And she was like, "The worst he can say is no." It was like, "I was like, is he a dickhead?" I'm like, "Well, he's about as dick much of a dickhead as I am." And she goes, "And if he says no, he's not going to be an ass about it. He's just going to say no." <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So, 
it, these little things like that. And and one of the things I love about this show is having these conversations with people because someone's going to listen to this and they may go, you know what? Maybe I need to stop saying things about myself. Maybe I need to stop because the self, the self narrative is just as dangerous as any external narrative. It's the, if your mother calls you crazy, that is as damaging as you telling yourself you can't do things, you're stupid, you always fuck up, everything never goes my way. All of these stories are as powerful regardless of the source. It is, it is just, it, it builds a trench in your brain. The pathways from this to this, just every time you tell that story, it gets a little bit deeper. And soon you're helpless to it. It's just the way life is. It's not, you don't have any data that backs this up. You just go, terrible things happen to me. And it's because you put the brackets around two or three terrible things that happened and not around the 50 or 60 magnificent things that happened during your day. And that's a choice. That's a choice. And it's at some point you sort of lose control over it because instead of looking at your day and going, well, how much of this was powerful and awesome and how much of this was really terrible and debilitating, instead of looking at that with objective eyes, you just run it through the filter of terrible things happen to me. And you, it just auto highlights these yeah. tragedies in your day and you file them away. Well, another shitty day. <laughs> and in the meantime, your friend who called you for lunch and the person who's in love with you, who sent you the message or picked up the gift or the, the flower you passed on your ride or the, the couple you saw in the park that was in all of the little details that make this world kind of cool, the stuff you created, the, the chapter you managed to get through despite the writer's block, the wonderful cup of coffee you discovered or the way you do like your sugar with it just at the right temperature and the right it's all of those little miraculous details just get omitted and you're like oh the mailman you know bumped my trash can on the, you're just you're just mired in this pointless bullshit and it just that's your story making that so that's a choice you know it is, you, you say that and so me and one of my closest friends my twin we have this thing every morning it's called a five and one I forget if she created it or if it was something her therapist talked about, but it's five things you like and one thing you like about yourself. And every morning uh, for Monday, well, not every morning, Monday through Friday, we do this. And I'm finding out more things that I like about myself. Sometimes it's repetitive, but it's still things that I like about myself or just these little random things. Like one day the theme, I just, it was just, I was uh, Russell Dodderman artists I comic book artists I love he makes these vibrant pictures and like just these bright colors in the theme just for me the five things I love were the color yellow green purple red orange and the thing I appreciate the one thing I liked about myself was my appreciation for color and it's these little positive things like that that kind of just give me the extra umph through the day there's something to I'm a I journal extensively. Uh, there's there's a number of ways to do it, and it's all individual. But for me, it, it's it sounds so woo woo and kitschy. But to to keep a bit of a list of that you can call it a gratitude list or a list of things you like or what, whatever that is, um, a list of even sometimes a really beautiful turn of phrase. If you read something that's just really well said a quote something that kind of grabs your your brain and you go you know what i'm i'm just going to capture that and eventually you'll have you'll be able to look back and you'll go wow i i got five or six things on that day and they're all and you can revisit them and they're kind of beautiful and it reminds you that if you flip through a couple of days you'll end up with 25 or 30 things that you would probably just you know they they jumped into your brain and you would have discarded on any other day but it's a point to write them down and it's a point to focus on them. And hopefully by doing that, you end up with more positive stuff in, in your bucket of things that happen to you than you do negative. So this is some, this is something I, I thoroughly enjoy doing. I love doing this on Instagram is I'll find something that I'm reading and then I'll screen cap it and I'll throw it on one of my stories. There's this one 
particular uh one particular um thought bubble two particular thought bubbles garth ennis wrote about the punisher and it's a, a good segue to the comic book stuff and i said to myself i want to write something as beautiful as this no matter how dark it was and i just downloaded it goes it began a year ago in the rain on a pitch black brooklyn night by the time it had all finished i knew the rain would fall forever and wow and i just i read that and i was like that is one of the darkest and most beautiful things i've ever read in my life and i couldn't believe i read this a million times and this is one of the reasons why i love this journey that i'm on where i'm trying to i read every day i read every day just about but i'm taking note of every comic book i've read this year mm -hmm. and i only mark the I only i only mark the comic book down if i've read every single word in it and it has given me a greater appreciation of writers in comic books and how a creator can make two characters that are very similar so different with just how they talk. Mm -hmm. Like you could like someone will go, well, what's the difference between um Injustice Superman and Superman? And I was like, it's in like besides like you know the contrast of like what they think is good and evil. It's the way they talk. It's something that simple. Paying attention to the you know, if if in a good movie script, theoretically, they say you should be able to cover up the, the actual character names and read the script and know exactly who's talking when. Just based on the little ticks and the little the little ways they they phrase things. Uh if you look back at some of the characters I think that are easiest to to probably put in a box like that, but if you look at data from Star Trek The Next Generation or something like that. A very different sentence structure from, you know, say someone who's neurotic like Barkley on that show or whatever, but also no contractions. There were certain things that you would just, oh, you know, be able yeah. to write it that, would, it. that would be very important as a writer to pay attention to to make sure you get right. Yeah, That's a uh, um, God of War. Mm -hmm. The new, and I didn't notice it until the newest one. Kratos doesn't use contractions. He's like, I will not. I cannot. It will not. It is not. <laughs> I'm like, but just say isn't. <laughs> but I'm like, yep. he can't because that's just not how he talks. Exactly. And it's, it's, I'm loving and appreciating just like the way creators create and the way writers write because it's so, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, in, in comic books too, uh, part of the appreciation is the brevity. You're you're very limited in how you can tell the story. If you're a, you know, a long form prose writer, you know, a George R. R. Martin or somebody like that, the concept of writing a comic book would have to be stifling. The idea of of cramming I write in thousand page epic novels and you want me to do this in not just twenty two pages, but you want me to do it in, you know, sixteen blurbs per page. Like it's so learning to get a character down to that that really efficient just the meat of them right saying yeah. saying what well, especially when you look at the big busy comic books uh even if you, if you revisit like old secret wars or some of the things that have just all the this oh mass my God. Um, neil gaiman you brought up jordan uh -huh. R. Martin. neil gaiman like mm -hmm. i don't know how you can tell like, someone asked me if, if um sandman was worth reading i said oh it's great if you enjoy reading <laughs> <laughs> they go, what do you mean? I'm like, he's very wordy and everything is very descriptive. It's <laughs> very similar. It's it's almost like an evolution of the way Stan Lee used to write, where he goes, Wolverine will pop his diamond heart out of Mancy and yep. Claus. And like, but it's like, but it's done in I don't want to say in a better way, in a different way. And so <laughs> well, Ga Gaiman would Gaiman would break a lot of rules with Sandman too. You would have, you know, if I'm, I'm probably juxt or jamming together uh, memories, but you'd have like someone in the back seat of a car and someone driving, and they'd be going down the road. Yet you'd have a word bubble that's just this literal Hamlet-esque monologue. Yes. And 
and brilliantly written and every word is something you want to suck and chew on and reread and it's it's wonderful it's almost something you know that the pictures just kind of would be there for to augment and i th i think eventually sandman you know uh, gaiman got more comfortable in the medium but it's he's this this multimedium animal who who can write an episode of doctor who as well as he can write the graveyard book as well as he can write episodes of sandman you know he just and then then different tv shows it's he's just the that guy understands words and what they do to us yeah. that's that's the form i don't think matters and i think it just to see him in something like sandman you see him you see the the edges of what's possible in a comic book get pushed out a little bit and it's funny because when i heard that they were making a show i said i was ecstatic i was like this is going to be either the greatest thing ever created or everybody's gonna hate it there's gonna be no mm -hmm. in be there's gonna be no in between with sandman and they picked this this guy with this very mon very like plain face tom sturridge he's fantastic he just absolutely destroyed that role and it's like, and rest in peace to Kevin Conroy, when I read Sandman now, his voice is the one I'm going to hear now. Mm -hmm. There's a, There was a sereneness to it. There was a, the, the steadfastness of, of Morpheus was just remarkable. Um, the, I, I don't like Patton Oswalt. And I could be in the minority. I don't, regard, it's he grates on me. His, he's a little sanctimonious in per like his character i just there's certain parts of him and when i hear his voice it <laughs> doesn't do the positive things it probably does for other people it doesn't do them to me so i suffered through that raven and it just <laughs> killed me having to hear that squawk come out i just every time and it's well acted and it's you know it's great it's just that that actress you hate in a movie you love and you just go this would be if you just and I don't even know who could have or would have done it better. I have no solution here. I'm not offering up a, not him, just do this. Part. I just wasn't a him fan, and I'm not. I'm so. trying to think, because I know there's an actor, like an actor and actress like that for me, and I can't remember who it is, but there's somebody. Josh Gad is another one for me. Uh, I Josh Gad, he played Olaf in Frozen, but past <laughs> that. You actually, you actually do a good um, impression. <laughs> it's the funniest shit ever. Um, <laughs> my name's <laughs> my name's Olaf, and I like warm hugs. I like warm hugs. <laughs> oh, oh god, Dale Cheeseman had me cracking up when you guys were talking about. It. He goes, "This this movie's for boys too." 